Yo everyone, welcome back to the Uncle Sharma channel. You know what time it is, it's time to preview Inter's match against Leverkusen, Monday night, 8 o'clock UK time. First of all, gotta celebrate what happened last night. Juve have been knocked out of the Champions League by the team that's seventh in the Uber Eats League, Lyon. It's a beautiful summer's day. The breeze is um, stupendous. Memphis Depay, my king. Ice cold penalty. Juve out. Sari crying. Quadrado crying. Dybala crying. Inject that content right into my veins. It almost feels like a trophy. But speaking of trophies, the Europa League trophy is the trophy that Inter need to go for. We have to go for it. We are one of, if not the favourites to win in terms of the squad that we've got. It's either us or Man United in terms of, you know, the bookies' favourite. But, you know, with Sevilla in there, you never know with Sevilla. This competition is, is their home. Like, these guys own the competition and we saw they smash through Roma like bar. Um, so we can never count out Sevilla, even though the, the squad is not as strong as it was in previous years. Eva Banega you know, putting on the masterclass against Roma, putting tears in my eyes. I can't believe we let that guy go. But anyway, looking forward to Leverkusen. Um, it'll be a completely different match compared to our Hetafe match, you know. 1-0, but it was not an easy match. Hetafe could have had a goal there, but all of Hetafe's game was based upon stopping Inter from playing, you know, stopping the match, you know. It's 29 fouls in total from both teams and 19 of those were from Hetafe, so, you know, shows what type of match it was. The team was full of wrestlers. On the other hand, Leverkusen are almost the opposite team, you know, a team with an average age of around 24, 25 years of age. Inter is around 28, you know, that's a big difference. You know, it's a youthful team, a lot more attacking. You know, the game is not based on stopping other people. They try to play their own game, you know, possession-based and counter-attacking football. Very, you know, typical of German football. So a decent team to watch. I watched them a couple of times over the... Um, over the uh, COVID period, German football was the first to come back. So, you know, they had our eyeballs for a few weeks. And uh, Leverkusen, you know, an interesting, nice team to watch. Uh, some really interesting players, obviously, we must all know. If you don't know, you must be living under a rock about Kai Havertz, the most important player, the star player, star boy, generational talent for Germany and Leverkusen. Um, top goal scorer for them and also one of the best assisters in general, the game. The whole game plan is goes through him, you know, he's the creator, he's the finisher, he does a bit of everything. Um, lovely left foot, it looks like he'll be moving on to Chelsea at the end of the season, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The team usually plays in a 4-2-3-1 formation, earlier on in the season they played more of a 3-4-3, but it seems to have changed to a 4-2-3-1, but still, you know, they still, uh, when they attack, a lot of the times they build up with three men. Uh, at the back they have the two Bender twins, Sven and Lars. Where I'm worried mostly is the wings. They have really pacey wingers. The RB, the Frenchman, is really, really quick. You know, one of the quickest players in the German league. Um, and he's been putting up decent numbers this season. So we'd really need to watch out for him on that uh, left-hand side if he does start. Or it could be Leon Bailey, an another pacey winger with a little bit more quality than the RB, a little bit more finishing product. Um, you know, was really a top talent a few years ago, but he's kind of fallen off a little bit, but he's still, you know, a decent talent. and. You know, so on that right-hand side, it'll be interesting to see who plays to counteract that pace. Um, you know, last match Godin played, but I don't think he's suited to playing a role where, you know, we might be getting counter-attacked on the left-hand side. That is the side where they primarily, you know, um, put in longer balls down to try to use uh, utilise Bailey or uh, at the RB's pace. So I'd rather see someone like D'Ambrosio. Or, you know, if it has to be Skriniar, you know, because he hasn't played last couple of matches, so he probably is the one with the most rested. Or we might continue with the playing D'Ambrosio as the right wing back. Um, as we've seen in the last few matches, you know, D'Ambrosio, as we know, is a more of a defensive player. I don't really like to see him playing in the wing back position because he really offers not much going forward when we have the ball. Um, he's really good when you have set pieces, that ball situation and his last, uh, you know, his second uh, far post runs that are like, you know, better than the striker almost. But when we have the ball, when we have to try to build up with him and we have to try, you know, be players 1v1, he really doesn't offer much. But, you know, in this case, when we have these pacey wingers against us, it might be useful to have him either as a right wing back or in the right centre back position, which I think is the best position for him in this team. Because, you know, he can move up as well as we've seen. We, our centre backs do like to go up a little bit in this 3-5-2 uh, formation. 
it seems like we will keep a 3-5-2 formation. You know, once Conte decides on the formation, it seems like I say that's the end. <laughs> Is that's now it's three five two or death before the last seven eight matches before that it was three four one two or death. You know this guy. It's once he goes for a formation, it's that's it. Nothing else. I'm happy with it. It offers a bit more cover in the middle. We've seen with the three four one two. I felt like we were a bit more exposed, but it means that Christian Eriksen doesn't mean get to play. Uh, and I like to see him play. I like to see him getting more and more integrated in the team. You know we'll have more space to play against uh, this Leverkusen team. It's not against like against Getafe where you know there was no space, but we saw that Eriksen came on in the second half against Getafe and made an impact with um, a run behind their defense, uh, which opened up for his goal. And um, yeah, I'd like to see Eriksen starting, but it looks like as we see here for the who scored uh, predicted lineups, it looks like it'll be another Barella, Brozovic, Galliardini midfield. Again, Brozovic much improved in that CDM role compared to when he plays in the centre mid role in the 3-4-1-2. Bastoni should retain his place as you know the guy with his left foot, and you know pretty much he was the man of the match, man of the match performance last time round. So he has to play the Vrij, of course we know, player of the season, defender of the season, Serie A, and Danovic on the left hand side it should be Ashley Young retaining his place once again, although he played the full 90 minutes last match, which was a bit worrying. I hope. I was hoping he was going to get a little bit of rest, but contemplating for the full 90. It's important for us to rotate these players in the next few matches because the games are coming so thick and fast. But hopefully he'll be all right to start then. Up front again, I don't see anything else than a Lautaro-Lukaku partnership. Lukaku can break a record next match. So um, he's got the, he's matched the record for Alan Shearer scoring eight Europa League matches in a row. And he could break that record by scoring another one in the next match and making a nine. And uh, I see him doing it, I see him uh, breaking that record, you know, um, Leverkusen's defence is okay, as I said, Lars Bender and Sven Bender, they're okay, not the most uh, physical uh, defenders, uh, Tapsoba is a bit more of a physical specimen, but, you know, apart from that, I feel like the Lautaro-Lukaku partnership should have the uh, edge over that defence, in general, the whole uh, Leverkusen team is it's quite a shorter team, I think the average high is around 181, 182 whereas ours is under 83 under 85 i believe depending on who we play and we're a much more physical team so we should be able to physically overpower them the important thing is not to get counter-attack too easily um with balls over the top you know as i said leon bailey and uh, um, the rb on the counter are big big threats in the midfield that uh, demir bai and the uh, arangiz are a decent partnership you know demir bai is a guy that I thought Inter would be looking at. He's a good ball carrying midfielder, very technical, offers a lot, you know, box to box. Arangiz is a very Conte type player, you know, uh, plucky, hard working, you know, gets stuck in. So it'll be an interesting midfield battle there. But I think overall we'll have the uh, edge over them. Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts says. Who would you start? Would you go with the 3 4 1 2? Would you stick with the 3 5 2? Who would you bring backs be? Would you stick with D'Ambrosio? Would you bring in Candreva or even Victor Moses? Start screening out. Let me know in the comments below. Make sure to leave a like. My match prediction is a 2-1 victory for Inter. And uh, take us to the next round. And uh, who should be um, Shakhtar Donetsk. And uh, yeah, I'll see you for the post-match on Monday night. And hopefully it'll be a positive one. Ciao.